It's always a great way to begin the morning is to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us, to enter into worship, to direct it towards the Lord, allow those words and that time with the Holy Spirit to kind of prepare us to hear the Word of God. I'm wondering how many of you are ready to hear the Word of God today? Very good. That's a good show of hands. I appreciate that. Makes me feel less alone up here. By the way, many of you may have noticed I'm wearing a jacket today for no apparent reason. Because it doesn't matter. I pick arbitrary days to do that just because I feel bad for you people. It's hard enough to pay attention up here. I got to give you something to look at. That's nice. So every once in a while I clean up. I notice people treat me nicer. Like, pastor. I was like, I look so terrible before. That's okay. My inner puppy's fine. I'm good. Yes, welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship where the pastor never knows what to say in the beginning. That's why I make slides. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm grateful for every one of you to be here. I, my job is to be able to share with you the things that God has shown me and hopefully I have integrated into my life and walked in my life with and I get to share those insights with you. Uh, just so that you know, I'm not here to gather information and spew it on you without it affecting me. It needs to affect me first. And the same thing, if we're going to share Christ with people, it needs to be something that has made an effect in our life before it's ever going to make an effect in someone else's life. And sometimes, even contrary to that, God will use us in the midst of our stupidity and our worthlessness and our failure, and God speaks through us anyway, which I bank on every Sunday. Yes, I say so as well. So, this is where we are. We're in the week between the time when Jesus comes into Jerusalem and they say Hosanna in the highest and they welcome him as the Messiah, the Christ, and the Pharisees are telling Jesus to tell his disciples to shut it down because he's being worshiped. And it's the one time we see Jesus accepting worship until we get to the book of Revelation, of course. But Jesus accepts their worship and he says, if they keep quiet, the stones are going to cry out because Jesus came home to Jerusalem, a place that was promised that he would. As he spends that week, this is the Passover week, they would typically bring a lamb and the lamb would be inspected to make sure that it was, there were four days they could do this, make sure it was flawless. And Jesus is now being inspected by all of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Essenes are taking a real hard look at him. The common people heard him gladly, the scripture says. But it's these folks who are very surreptitiously picking apart at him and they're quizzing him. Last week, we looked at the problem. They come and ask Jesus about his authority. And they say, by whose authority or, or who gave you this authority to do what you're doing? Because he had just recently cleansed the temple, cast them out, made a whip, out of cords and whipped the animals and cleaned the temple out so that it could be a place of prayer and not a place of robbery, which is what they turned it into. And they said, well, but what authority? And he says, well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer if you answer mine. What about John the Baptist? What was his authority? And after having a little conference among themselves, they said, we don't know. And he goes, well, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things, which shows you don't need to answer every question that's asked you, right? Some of you like to be open and honest about everything with everyone. Probably want to dial that back a little bit. Then Jesus presents this parable of the vineyard. And we know that Jerusalem is the vineyard. And he says, there was a man who had a vineyard and he set it in the place of vine dressers and he went on a long journey. He sent some people to, to get their cut, that the owner would get his cut, and usually it's a 60-40 cut. The people tending the vineyards would get 40%, and the owner would get 60%. Came to get his cut, and they beat him, tossed him out. He sent another one. He sent another one. All of them disgraced, and finally he sends the son. They say, oh, if I send my son, perhaps they'll listen to him. 
the son comes and they say, if we kill this guy, then we get to inherit the property because you were allowed to take property that was unclaimed. They assumed that the father was dead and they could kill the son. And Jesus is prophesying about his very death, that he is the son that comes to the vineyard and he's rejected by the chief priests and he's handed over to the Romans. Oh, and we talked about the judgment. And Jesus is that stone that the builders rejected that has now become the chief cornerstone. It is the stone in which everything else is measured off of and everything else is supported by. And Jesus is that stone. And he says, if you fall upon this stone, you'll be broken. In other words, in humility, if you come to him and give him your life, then you will be broken and it will be no longer you who lives, it will be Christ who lives in you. But when this stone falls upon you in judgment, it will grind you to powder. And so Jesus explains about this coming judgment that we have to look forward to. Either we have fallen upon Christ as our savior or he will fall down on us like a judge. So they continue to look at him and in the beginning in Luke chapter 20, it says, so they watched him and they sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. It's interesting, they asked him about what power or authority he had and they couldn't decide about John the Baptist, which means they already made up their mind about him. And now they're looking to take him and turn him over to the authorities. I think that's a rather interesting combination. This week, we're gonna talk about Jesus being inspected and they're going to quiz him in three, three areas about Caesar and taxes, about Moses and marriage, about David and the Christ, and then there are gonna be some closing words that Jesus has about judgment. So you've got Caesar, you've got Moses, you've got David. We've got a, a wild line up here. So they're gonna quiz Jesus on his theology, his integrity. All of these things are gonna be up for grabs as they try to find out whether he is who he says he is beginning in verse 20. And so they watched him and they sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and authority of the governor. And then they asked him saying, teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly for you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, why do you test me? Show me a denarius whose image and inscription does it have? And they answered and said, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. But they could not teach him, they could not catch him in his words in the presence of all the people. And they marveled at his answer, and they kept silent. You can see there are two other passages. There's one in Matthew and Mark where they take the same thing. There's a couple of little variations that some of them pick up that the others don't, and I'll, I'll bring those out for you. But it says, they watched him and sent spies. These are not real people with real questions. These are people that are looking to trip up Jesus. As we've seen all this week, he's gonna be tested in all of his areas. So these are professionals at asking hard questions. Are any of you professionals at asking hard questions? Thank you, Jenna, for being so honest. Hallelujah, brother. I, I commend you for raising your hand. Yes, some of you, some of you are experts at asking hard questions. And it usually begins with a furrowed brow where there's a number 11 right here. And it's pastor. So... I get those questions and I always remember this. I, I, are you here to test me? You here to... I'm just kidding. I love you people. These men were spies. They weren't sincere questioners. These were the Herodians and we find this out from Matthew 22. This particular group of people is listed in that passage alone, that they were Herodians. And you might say, well, who are the Herodians? The ones with the blue hair and the nose rings? No. The Herodians were a sect of the Jewish religion that 
was in favor of having the, the line of Herod continue, which is having a king, a Jewish king installed in Jerusalem. So that's, they were, they were much more political than any of the other offshoots like the Pharisees or the Sadducees. So they were hooked in politically. They were more interested in managing the government and having oversight. And so, and it's interesting that they have a question about taxes as to whether they should submit to Caesar or not, because they're the ones who think we shouldn't have to submit to this evil government. We shouldn't give them our money because this evil government is only going to do evil things with our good money that we worked so hard for. Right? Any of you feeling that? You give your money to the government and the government is teaching LBGTQ, LMNOP in schools and forcing you to understand all that stuff and teaching eight-year-olds sex education. They're also performing abortions with your tax dollar. So maybe you understand the question a little better. Should we subsidize the government even though they do evil things? So Jesus asks us to think about this. Their mission was to entrap Jesus in his words. Isn't it funny? They tried to trick God the Son. That's funny. Try to trick God. I don't know if you've ever tried to do that. You know, you get your mind set and you're going to do something, you go, I guess it'd be okay. God will forgive me. I know you good people never thought those things, but I, I, every once in a while I get one of those, I got to shoot it real quick. The mission's to entrap Jesus in his words. Their method was to flatter Jesus into recklessness. Do you know what it is when somebody flatters you? The scripture says they're spreading a net for your feet in Proverbs. In other words, they're trying to trap you. You get on the phone and it's a telemarketer and they tell you all sorts of really nice things. Hi, good day, how are you? And then they mispronounce your name and then they lose you. <laughs> they try to be real nice and cozy up because they want something. And so they flatter. That's what these men do. They say, we know, we know that you're a teacher and you're gonna teach rightly because you don't show favoritism. One of the other passages says, because you are not a respecter of persons. You don't respect people. In the King James, that's a little shocking to see. But he didn't show favoritism. He didn't put certain people above other people. He talked to everyone equally, from the prostitute that was thrown at his feet, accused of adultery, to uh, uh, the high priest who shows up and asks him difficult questions. Although he gave to each one what each one needed. The woman at his feet needed forgiveness and grace. The guy trying to trick him, he needed to be humbled. And Jesus could dish it both, which is why I love him. Now, the thing I learned from this little passage is not all questions that you're asked are authentic. You know, like the guy that ran up to Jesus and said, Jesus, talk to my brother and tell him he needs to share the inheritance with me. Are you concerned about justice or are you concerned about getting your part? You're just concerned about getting your part. You don't care whether it's right or not. And if, and if you got all of it and he got none of it, you'd be quite happy about that, at least the guy in this situation. So not all questions, they're usually loaded. And there are reasons why people ask certain questions. Have you noted that? that? Your kids, as they get older, begin to craft questions a little differently. Or my wife, she's a good target. Hey, you got anything scheduled for today? You see, I know what that means. The subtext is, I have something for you to do today, and I'm, getting, I'm asking you to give me permission to take care of your schedule and assign it to you. You guys don't do that in your house? <laughs> hey, honey, what do you got going on today? Why? <laughs> well, I was just wondering. Why? Well, because I, I was just kind of thinking, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to answer that question because it puts my schedule in your hands. I'm not going to put my schedule in your hands. What do you want? And this is what she used to do. This is the woman she once was. See, you're seeing 
the newer, better person here. Because I just, tell me what you want. I was hoping that we could do this and we could do that, and then maybe we could do this and this and that and the other thing. And I just say, usually, no. No, I don't do that. I, I say yes. I say yes. Because, you know, I love my wife, and if my schedule's open, she's the first person I'm supposed to serve besides God, and so I'm on it. Un unless it's really hard. <laughs> or it takes a long time. Then we have to schedule it. We put it in my phone, and we get it done. But I notice that not all questions are authentic. Sometimes there's a hidden text below it. And I think we need to be wise to understand that when people ask things and ask questions. There's usually something else that they're not saying. Have you noticed that about people? It's like they don't want to say it out loud. They're embarrassed to, like a lot of you good people come up, oh, Pastor Dave, I, I don't want to bother you. What am I doing, brain surgery right now? Or, you can come and ask me a question at any point in time. And if anyone happens to be standing there having a conversation with me, just say, excuse me, and butt in. Because that's what they did. Not all questions are authentic. That's the first thing I learned. Not all questions are sincere. Sometimes people try to trip you up. Like, pastor. And they don't have the 11. They're pastor. <laughs> the scripture says this. How do you reconcile that with this other passage? <laughs> do, 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 do. You know, not all questions are sincere, and that's okay, because I'm supposed to be ready to give an answer for all those who see a hope in me. I, I need to give an answer for what that is. I need to be ready. It's my stinking job after all. Not all people who speak well of you think well of you. Have you found this to be true? Yeah. I have found people who will come to my face and they'll go, oh, 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 and they'll say all these nice things. And then somebody says, did you just offend that person? I said, well, not that I know. Well, they went out pretty mad at you. They were saying some stuff. Okay. Well, uh, I'll go track them down or you, you could send them to me. Usually I don't see those people again because they know I'm looking for them. Learn how to accept a compliment and identify flattery. Here's a, here's a tricky one. Because sometimes there are people that are excessive with their uh, compliments. Learn how to be spiritually discerning and don't just believe everything everybody says. And Jesus knew how to do this wonderfully. He saw right through what was happening here. These are professionals, okay? They came up to Jesus and they flattered him, and they said, we know that you're not showing favoritism. We know you teach the word of God straight. You know, if somebody tells me that, I'm like, yeah. That's the tendency, right? I've learned to just wait and see where this goes. In Luke 6.26, Jesus says, woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so they did your fathers to the false prophets. The false prophets were spoken well of by everyone. Be careful when everyone speaks well of you. Our job is not to make sure everybody likes us. Our job is to make sure we do what the Lord would have us do. Amen. And so they asked their question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Well, Caesar was considered God, by the way, and you'd have to burn incense and do any number of other things to recognize that and be part of the system. But they're saying, should I pay taxes to Caesar or not? They're not asking about worship. They're asking about contr contributing. But he perceived their craftiness. Thank you, Jesus. And he said to them, why do you test me? It's because they wanted him to fail. He says, show me a denarius. Whose inscription Whose image and inscription does it have? And they answered and said, Caesar's. And he said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. But they could not catch him in his words in the presence of the people, and they marveled at his answer and kept silent, like they probably should have from the beginning. <laughs> and so he says, okay, why are you testing me, guys? You got a denarius? Any of you, if you have a wonder if you should pay taxes, I would ask you do, you, do you have a dollar bill? Can I see a dollar bill? I'll bet you you got one. Or a few. 
or at least a coin. Now, see, we all have dead presidents on our money, which doesn't work quite well with the analogy. But see, Caesar was alive, and he had his name, and he had his imprint on his money. And so if you have money in your pocket, you have consented to be part of a system. If you have American money, and you're in an Arab country, your money means nothing. If, you're, if you have Canadian money, some of it you might be able to get by with in a vending machine. But if you're in a particular system, you're buying into that system. You're under its authority, and you've agreed by having money in your pocket that you're part of the system. You've already agreed. It's, it's a done deal, right? Any of you have a bank account? I bet you all have a bank account. Except some of you there are too young to have one. But that means you've submitted to a system. Jesus, we're, we're told in Matthew 22, it's a little bit stronger. Matthew picks up on this, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Which is a little stronger. He said, show me the tax money. And so they brought him a denarius. It's interesting. The very people that are saying, should we pay taxes, have the tax money in their pocket. What's the problem? They just don't want to let it go. Right? Now, there are all sorts of isms here in this world where, you know, there are factions that say, taxes are, are not constitutional. Well, let me know how that goes for you. <laughs> it usually doesn't go very well. Possessing money denotes submission to a system. And so unless you're still trading chickens, <laughs> and even though, you need to, you need to take care of Caesar. Because Jesus said, pay Caesar the things that are Caesar's. It's got his face and his name on it. And when you die, how much of that are you taking with you? None of it. You're going to leave it to somebody who didn't earn it and will probably squander it in days. You then must take responsibility to contribute. By the way, we drive on roads. We have school systems. We have an army. We have a navy. We have an air force. We have marines. We have all sorts of things that our government pays for including policemen, firemen, ambulances, hospitals, parks, all kinds of things. You ever look at where your taxes go? I, used to, I had a chart one time here. I didn't bring one today because I didn't want to bore you. So whose image is on you? It says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render unto God the things that are God's. Well, whose image are you made in? You're made in the image of God. Imagine that. I don't think he's got a nose like you or a smile like you. Or, it's not physical attributes. We're created with an eternal soul. We're created with a spirit. So there are aspects of our lives that are created in the image of God. Whose inscription is upon you? The scripture says, David says, I have hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I would hope that the word of God is inscribed in your hearts, that you have it memorized and you can pull it up in an instant when you need it because we are in a battle after all. So we're to render unto God which is God's. So what percentage of you do you think God is due? 100% or 110 Depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to an exaggerator and a non-critical thinker, they'll say 150%. All right. I'm not going to argue with your math. Just go and do it. The next thing he's challenged with is Moses and marriage. They say, so then some of the Sadducees, you see, this is a different group, who deny that there is a resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, teacher, which is showing him reverence immediately, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife, and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. I won't ask for a show of hands. <laughs> now, there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died without children, and the second took her as wife, and he died childless. And then a third took her, and in like manner, the seven also. And they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, 
whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as a wife. You get the idea. They're trying to stump the teacher. And Jesus answered and said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living. For all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. But after that, they dared not ask a question of him anymore. So you see, first it was the Herodians. They asked him their question about taxes, and so they went away. And now he's got another group that steps up to bat. Okay, I'm going to give it a shot. And it's now the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the liberal branch of Judaism. They were the modernists. They didn't subscribe to the prophets. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe there were angels. They didn't believe in resurrection. They believed in the first five books of Moses. You know what the first five books of Moses is full of? Laws about how to live today and today alone. They didn't give a rip about the future. They didn't care. They didn't know. They didn't believe all the rest of the things that God says. So they, these were the, the hyper liberals because they said, well, we got to toss this out and toss this out. And, ah, we'll keep these five books. This is good. So their Bible was much thinner, a little lighter on the arm. And it said, that's why they were so sad, you see. And that's how I remember it. That's why they were so sad, you see, because there was no resurrection for them. There was none of the prophets and they're missing a whole bunch. So Jesus is going to address them. By the way, there is this passage in Deuteronomy 25. I just thought that I'd read it to you just so that you could scratch your head a new bald spot. Verses 5 to 10 says, If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and he has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. This is primarily so that you don't lose land and so that a woman is provided for and taken care of. Her husband's brother shall go into her. Yes, a very graphic description. Take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. That's called a Leverite marriage. And it shall be that the firstborn son in which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother. So you're to name him after your brother, even though he's your kid. That his name may not be blotted out of Israel. This is how they maintain property. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife and let his brother's wife go up to the gate of the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up a name for his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. And the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. And if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then the brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit on his face and answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house and his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him who has his sandal removed. <laughs> How many of you knew this? A couple of you. What the heck is that? It gives weddings a completely different perspective, doesn't it? You know, your, your brother marries somebody and you're like, okay, all right. Or, oh no, please don't marry her because if you die, I, 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 I. what? What's the matter? Well, you know what? This was done to keep the name in Israel. This was done so that the name would not disappear. You know what it is to get married and have no children? And, and as far as a man would be concerned, if I had no men children, I would have no one to pass my last name onto. So my last name would basically die out, at least from me. 
And so that's why people liked having boys. Oh, I got a boy. <laughs> it's good. My name will continue and they can have property and all that kind of stuff, at least in this culture. So it was designed for a good practical measure among those people. I don't know that we need to do that anymore. Just thought I'd let you know. In case you were thinking about it. Because then if you don't want to do it, there's a way out, but you'll be disgraced. You'll be disgraced because you're not allowing your brother's family line to continue. Which, if you think about it, seems pretty cruel. So that's what that's all about, in case you're going, what? There it is. You're probably still going to say what? The book of Ruth is based on this whole practice. If you read through the book of Ruth, it's, it's a really incredible thing. Woman goes, has a husband, and has these wonderful sons who marry wives. Her husband dies, her boys die. She, got, she has the two, two girls left who aren't really hers by blood. And she says, well, I'm going to go home. I'm going to go back to Israel, and I'm going to you know, see if I can re recoup some land and, and gather with my people. And she takes one of the two girls with him, with her. And she says, okay, my people are your people, and the whole thing. You guys know if you know the book of Ruth. And so it turns out that she ends up marrying a near relative, a kinsman and redeemer. And because of all that, she inherits property. And anyway, you got to read the story. It'll make you cry. The whole book of Ruth is based on this practice. So there, the Sadducees are coming with this thing because they don't believe in the resurrection. They go, okay, what about this situation, Jesus? Have you ever had people do this? In philosophy class, we used to do this all the time. Ask big questions where nobody could get. Can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? <laughs> anyway. Now there were seven brothers and they each took her as a wife and died without children. Each one of them. And then the question is, well, when they get to heaven, who's going to be the husband of this woman? I mean, that's an interesting question. A woman that's been with seven men. All is her husband. Which one is she going to be paired up with for eternity? Well, that's a lot of pressure. And you know Jesus' answer because we read on ahead. But if I had a son and he died in the hands of a woman and she wanted another one, I would probably be like Judah and be a little reluctant at handing him over. You start to have this sort of black widow mentality. Or maybe it's a brown recluse, I don't know. You get this idea that maybe there's a reason. And there are women who are multiple uh, killers of husbands to collect cash. It's warning you single people. You never know. These Sadducees were the religious liberals of their day. Um, liberals of the day means that they're trying to separate you from the orthodoxy and what has been understood as truth, and they're trying to get you to act heretical. It's essentially what a liberal is. Uh, so if you want to stamp yourself with that, be careful because you're in the same camp as the Sadducees. By the way, public service announcement. That spider on the bottom right, that's called a brown recluse. We have them around here. You can get bit by them. It's not good. You can always tell it's a brown recluse because when you get really close, it looks like they have a violin on their head. Do you see that? It looks like a violin. So if you see one of them, get real close. <laughs> and then squash it. So Jesus said, listen, the sons of this age marry and are given marriage, but those who are up in heaven, they're not going to marry. So there's no marriage in heaven. How many of you didn't know that? Only one of you. Wow. Okay. I'll move on. So the question is, is there marriage in heaven? Well, I think that's a really good question. I, I could think of a few more. Will there be animals in heaven? I get people ask me that question all the time. I say, absolutely. Well, why is that? Well, what about all the burgers you ate? You're going to meet those cows? <laughs> what about the eggs that you ate? And you, I mean, where's God draw the line? It, you know, I, I once had a bee I tied a string onto and watched him try to fly away. A little thread attached to him. It was kind of cool. It was like having a balloon. 
am I going to see him? I don't know. If you named it, would, does that mean you're going to see? Uh, I got worse questions. Can I have a pet in heaven? Will I be able to fly in heaven? What will I eat in heaven? Gee, Chinese or Greek? Will I like broccoli in heaven? Will we eat meat in heaven? How would the animals feel about that? How old are we in heaven? These are actual questions I've been asked, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stump you all. Will we sleep in heaven? No. But sleep is so good. <laughs> These and other questions will never be answered. Except for one. There will not be marriage in heaven. So you and me, baby, we'll be friends. I think the richness and the depth of relationship that we will have in heaven without sin getting in the way, without ulterior motives getting in the way, without our sin nature being there, it is going to be awesome. We are all going to be brothers and sisters. And she's my sister anyway, so it's good. What's the temperature in heaven? I'm sure people like Karen Foley are interested and Bill Zacker. What is the ideal temperature of heaven? Will it be 64? or 68, <laughs> or 72, like some people like to have it. Uh, just move to Florida and, you know, while you're alive, it'll be good. But even Moses showed in the burning bush that the dead are raised. He's now tackling the Sadducees' disbelief in the supernatural. And he's saying, God explained himself, and he said that he's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. And some of the scribes answered and said, teacher, you have spoken well. Notice it's the scribes who say he's answered. They're, they're a sect of the Pharisees, so they're the conservatives. So the Sadducees ask the question, and Jesus gives an answer to them, and they probably stood there with their mouth open, and the scribes chime in, yeah, get, take that. Teacher, you have spoken well, but after that, they dared not ask him a question anymore. So that's the second group of people who will no longer be asking Jesus a question this week because they put themselves out there and were humiliated. Moses, when he came to this bush that was all full of fire and was not being consumed, which is the picture of judgment, by the way, and so God is this picture of judgment. And yes, even this bush, which is a, a, a probably the thorn bush, was not consumed, which shows God's grace. So fire is a picture of judgment and God's grace is there because it's not being burned up. Rather interesting mix, rather, rather interesting way to introduce yourself to Moses. So he speaks to Mo Moses. You guys saw the movie, right? And he says, I am, by the way, that's how he revealed his name. Moses said, listen, I don't know your name. I can't do work for you because I can't tell people who you are. I can't make a business card or anything. And he says, well... Tell them I am sent you. God reveals himself as I am. I've always been, I am, and I always will be. I am the self-existent one. That's essentially what it means. It's, it's me. That's what he's saying. And it's interesting that he says, I am the God of all these dead guys. He is currently the God of all these dead guys, which means... They exist somewhere. Their soul is being preserved somewhere. There's a resurrection. You can be sure of it because Jesus showed us more than anyone else because he rose. Mark 12, 23 to 24 says, Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven have had her for wife. And I love what Jesus says. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? In Jersey, we'd say, what are you, stupid? <laughs> Just saying. That makes it all right. So Jesus squares off them. He says, you don't, you don't know the scriptures. And more importantly, you don't know the power of God. There are a lot of people that have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it. 
because they don't know the scriptures and they don't know the power of God. And the Sadducees are there. And Acts 17, 28 says, for we, in, we live in him. In, for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own prophets have said, for we are also his offspring. Yes, God exists and he is here today. And I hope he lives in the hearts of you folks through his Holy Spirit. And he's not gonna be a different God when we get there. He'll be the same God that you've grown to know and love. And I'm glad for that. And it says, and the, the, the scribes chime in and say, you have spoken well. <laughs> I imagine they were making a couple of facial expressions, kind of like Kramer. <laughs> the third thing Jesus is talking about is David and the Christ. And he said to them, how can they say that the Christ is the son of David? Now, David himself said in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David calls him Lord. How is it that he is his son? That's a rather interesting question. This is a quote from Psalm 110, which by the way, Psalm 110 is the most quoted Psalm of all the Psalms in the New Testament. In Matthew 22, we see uh, Matthew's take on it a little different. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. So Jesus asks the Pharisees, the ultra conservative party. And they say, well, who, who is the son of man after all? Who is this Messiah, this Christ? Wink, wink, wink. Who's to come? Well, he's the son of David, of course. And see, they knew that because the scriptures are just rife with explanations and promises that David would be the one who his line comes Christ. And by the way, he's through David's line in two directions, one from Mary, who was his natural mother, and from his father, who was his legal guardian, who wasn't his real father. And by the way, on both sides, they're related, related to David, which just makes you go, hmm. Our entire eternal destiny is determined by our answer to this question. What do you think about the Christ? And that's what Jesus asked. What do you think about the Christ? You know, that's the only thing that's going to matter when you stand before God. What'd you do with Jesus? What do you think about him? He's the Christ, the son of the living God. He's my savior. He's the one that died for my sins. He's the one I put faith in. He's the one I'm obedient to. He's the one for whom I live and move and have my being. And that will be the only answer that any of us will have to give if that's the answer we give. If not, you say, well, I'm a pretty good person. I never killed anybody, at least it's publicly known. Was the Christ from David? We have all of these passages here in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, and Psalms, including 2 Samuel, where this promise is given. So these Orthodox believers understood. The quandary is resolved by Christ being man and God. How can the Lord say to my Lord? David is talking about his descendant who would come, who would be Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, the Christ. How is it that the Lord God Almighty speaks to the Lord God Almighty who is the descendant of David? It's a confusing thing. The Pharisees didn't get it. They didn't understand how it could be. How can there be 100% man, 100% God? And by the way, he happens to be standing there talking to you. So Jesus is schooling them on their orthodoxy. The very one teaching them these truths is the fulfillment of the prophecy. He is the Lord, where the Lord speaks to the Lord. How is it that God can be human? I don't know. I don't make things like that. But God poured himself into human flesh he called himself the son of God, which makes him equal to the father. And they tried to kill him many times for saying it. So if they understood it, we certainly should. And the fourth thing Jesus talks is judgments upon these, these groups of people who have come one by one, sect by sect and questioned him. And he says, then in the hearing of all the people, which has got to be humiliating, he said to his disciples, beware of of the scribes. They're a group that we didn't talk about. The scribes were the ones who would take the word of God and pen it perfectly word by word. If they made a mistake, they had to get rid of the page and start all over again. And that's kind of tough when you've got a long text. 
These guys knew the word of God because it was their job to write it down, you know. I will not kick my friend. I will not kick my friend. I will. It's like that on a, on a board, I imagine. But they were writing down the scriptures who desire to go around in long robes. They love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, the best places at the feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Here's an example where Jesus turns to his disciples and he gives them a warning. Watch out for these people. Watch out for these people. And it's within the hearing of these people. Does that seem a little passive aggressive to you? Oh, no students of psychology. Okay. He warns his disciples and he says, beware. And in other words, you need to have a little fear and a little care. Beware of the appearance over substance. These guys were all about how they looked as a peer, as instead of really what was going on inside their hearts. You know, we run the same risk because we belong to a religious organization called the church, which gets a lot of heat because there's there are a lot of hypocrites, there are a lot of wolves that tend to infiltrate. Trust me. I want to beware of the appearance over substance like these guys were. Beware of the lure of the spotlight. I'm in a spotlight. You know, you don't have to be up here to be in the spotlight. You can take over a room, right? Maybe you know people that do that. Beware of the expectancy of primacy, that you're the most important person in the room. You deserve to have a special chair or a parking spot or a, a special committee devoted to your attention. They actually had this expectation that the world revolved around them. Beware of living for appetite and approval. They always wanted the best places and the best seats at the feasts. You know, they were made sure they hurried up, got there first, and you know, put their purse or their Bible or something there and say, no, you can't sit here. You can't, I put my jacket over here and you know, my cell phone over here. I, I got my space, okay. And that's what they would do because they didn't give a rip about anybody else. It was all about them. Beware of avarice and lovelessness. It says that they devour widows' homes. What they would do, because they were very, very wealthy from doing things they shouldn't be doing, is they would go and they would find widows who were hard up, who didn't have money to eat. They didn't have money to do anything. They're like, hey, listen, no problem. I've got a solution. I'm going to buy your place. And they would buy it for pennies on the dollar. And then as soon as they sealed the deal, they kicked her out. It's actually, it actually happened. They buy the place and then kick her out. And then they go to church and then they pray. He says, you devour widows' houses. In other words, you use your position to take advantage of people. Beware of that avarice, that, that money is the most important thing and people don't matter. Beware of that. And Jesus says, beware of these people because it could rub off. Beware of the fake it till you make it and convincing people that you're better than you really are. They would make long prayers for a pretense. In other words, they pretended. Oh, God of heaven. You know, you can, you can get pretty eloquacious. There's a word. I don't know where it came from. Eloquacious. It's to, to be eloquent, to, to, to speak flowery words, to impress people with your words and not necessarily the content of what you say. And we all run the risk of that, don't we? trying to get people to think more of us spiritually or physically. And it can happen in subtle ways. Jesus said, beware. Beware of these things. And he said it to his disciples. He didn't say it to anybody else. He said it to his disciples. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, Jesus says, beware of these things. Because I don't want my heart to get cold. It's about reputation over character. It's about the outside instead of the inside. It's about the presentation and not the communication. 
it's not about a relationship that you have with God and how you're walking in his steps and you're being humble and thinking of others first and all of that. It's about what people see on the outside. It's more important. So you might say, so how can I guard against these things? In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 13, those believers are exhorted this way. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall never enter my rest. Beware, there's that word, brethren, that's us, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That is a word for us, body of Christ. So I want to know which one of you is going to encourage me today. I'm just kidding. What we do is we need to understand that this world and my own genetic propensity leans selfish. And if I don't die to myself and if I don't enter into a relationship, first of all, with Christ, and if I don't accept his grace for it, I will fail and fumble miserably. And so will you. And so, if the Lord is speaking to you today, listen to what he's telling you and what he's speaking to your heart. Move out, take a step in faith, and do what the Lord's asking you to do, whatever that is. And encourage one another. Encourage one another. You know how important that is? There are people that I meet on the outside, and I invite them to church sometimes, and they're like, all right, yeah, maybe I'll come. And then they come, and of course they got that look. Yeah, I came. But then when they see you guys, and they see the love that you have for one another, when they see that this is real, and it's not just a show, it's authentic, they go, wow. That's something my words can't do. That's something that you guys can. So I want to make sure my heart doesn't get cold and that I don't get insensitive to what the Lord would have me do. I want to make sure that we encourage one another daily. So Jesus was tried and tested to see if what he did was right, if he was a right sacrifice. And by the way, he got an A+. Plus. And all of the various groups that came to try him, and we're going to see some more of this next week, they all failed miserably. What do we do about our government? We pray for them, as the scripture tells us. And because I'm part of it, and because I have denominations with dead presidents on it, I have an obligation to contribute and be part of it, and to hopefully make a difference in this world while I'm here. What do I do about marriage? I don't worry about all the complicated, long, impossible questions because I know enough about God that I trust him. And the, the small percentage of things that I don't know about, like a levirate marriage and all that weirdness, I can trust him with it. And how can Jesus be God and man? He is. And I may not understand it, but I do believe it. Amen. I hope you do as well because that's the only question that will determine where we're going to spend eternity. Guys, I thank you for coming today. And as the worship team comes up, I'm going to exhort you to kind of seal the deal here with the Lord. You've heard his word. You've heard it explained. And hopefully you understand more now than you did when you walked in the door. And that's always our goal here at Grace. But if there's something that the Lord has touched your heart about, that you think he may want you to be mobile with. 
I pray that you'd seal the deal and maybe tell somebody else. Maybe tell somebody that you're close to that they can pray for you. I would certainly love that opportunity or anybody here, I'll bet. I pray God's blessing on you guys today as you consider his word.